This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. It is helping to advance robotics and STEM education for young people around the world. And now, here's my conversation with John Clark. Ready for this? I've been ready for this my whole life. All right. I was thinking of doing a Kerouac style road trip across the United States. You know, after this whole COVID thing lifts, you ever take a trip like that? I've done a handful of long distance driving trips um, up and down the East Coast, but also from the West Coast. The things that I need to see here in this country and a road trip could potentially be the best way to see them. I think to do it effectively, you need an amount of time where you can be as leisurely as possible. There's no deadline and there's no, I've got to make it from Chicago to St. Louis by sundown to get to this place at this time. I think you really need to be able to take your time and, uh, and kind of like let the road take you where you need to go. It feels like you need a mission though. Ultimately, like there's a reason you need to be in San Francisco. That's like the Kerouac thing. You have to meet somebody somewhere kind of loosely in a few weeks. And then it's the, as you struggle on towards that mission, you meet weird characters that get in your way, but ultimately sort of create an experience. I think having a loose deadline is good, but that's a beginning. is fine but i think having very strict guidelines in between will rob you of certain experiences along the way if you have a time frame to get from philly to indianapolis and some awesome shit starts to happen in philly do you really want to have to cut it short because you got to be in indianapolis by sun up why do you have to be anywhere by any time for any reason really well, plans change plans That's change all the time I don't know. You got to make hard deadlines and then break them, totally change the plans, disappoint people, break promises. That's the way of life. Somebody's waiting for you in St. Louis and all of a sudden you you fell in love with a biker in New York. I don't know. I don't know what you're up to. I can appreciate that. Um, but on a trip like that, I feel like a trip with deadlines is for a different point in your life. And at this point in my life, I don't want any of the deadlines because it's not about meeting someone and disappointing them in St. Louis. It's about me not disappointing myself. You want to have, you want to have enough time in what you're doing to make sure that you get the full breadth of every experience that you encounter. How would you fully experience a place? How would you, you know, I, I don't think I've actually fully experienced Boston. Like how, if you were showing up to, to a city for a week on this road trip, what would you do? So I'm going to answer that in two parts. A few years ago, I had an opportunity to move out of Boston. And the thing that kept me here, no question about it, was the fact that I felt like I had a, um, a contract with my students. And I did not, I felt like a great many of them took a leap of faith uh, by joining my gym and like, you know, asking me to teach them what I know. And when I had an opportunity to leave Boston, I thought of those people and I thought I want to fulfill my obligation to them. So because I made a decision to stay here, I then that summer made a decision to endear myself to the city of Boston. And I tried to find lots and lots of different things to do. I can tell you that the coolest thing that I found to do in this city is um, the MFA where they have like on Friday nights, they'll have like different exhibits and stuff and they'll have like little beer carts and food tents and you can go like do a painting class off in the in, uh, on the side. Very cool night of things to do. But in general, whenever I'm in a new city, I try not to pay attention to Google and I try not to do anything that I find on a travel site. 
the best thing to do is to walk out of your hotel or wherever it is you're staying and find the most normal looking bar, have a drink and talk to a bartender. So the people, the people, the people, and then you can experience that town the way that they experience it. Even in a city where there are tons of tourist attractions, locals probably visit the same tourist attractions when they have visitors come from out of town. But you want to see how they view those places and how they visit them. And say, hey, this is Boston's, the pinnacle of Boston dining because it's very touristy. There are a handful of really good restaurants there, but I want to know where the, where the, I want to go to Bogey's place. I want to know like the the down low spots where what the hell's Bogey's place. It's like a little steakhouse in the back of J.M. Curly's. Exactly. It's like a shitty bar. Jam no, it's Curly's. just, a, it's just a, a bar with like bar food. But I think that like um, it's talk, South Boston. It is in Boston. Yeah, it's no, like, South Boston. No, it's in um, it's in the downtown area. Like. Um, I don't know what the neighborhoods are called here, honestly, because they call they they have an area called downtown Boston, and I don't even know what the hell that means. I think it's near the financial district. Where's Southie? Because I've heard about the Southie. Southie is South Boston, but is there is there a difference between South Boston and Southie? The term now actually is Sobo. Oh no! Yeah, it's. It's changed what, who, who took over what, what's the, you know, the goodwill hunting personality that's Southie, isn't it? Strong accent, those badass dudes. I came here right at the end of like what was South Boston. So when I got in my gym is in South Boston, the neighborhood was just starting to change. So I think as gentrification happened and they started building more luxury condominiums, they were buying all these old businesses out, all the mom and pop businesses. And I think that kind of changed the, the makeup of the community. And it wasn't only because there was an influx of new young people uh, with disposable income it's because there's an exodus of the, the older people who kind of grew up and raised their families there because they were being offered humongous sums of money for their homes that they had bought like in the late seventies and early eighties so that they could develop those areas. What I love about Boston is that, um, it's walkable. Huh. Um, the yeah. food scene is on is on the rise here, um, but I think you're you're hard pressed to find the charm that people think of when they think of old Boston and old New England city. See, I see it differently. People sometimes criticize like MIT, like for the thing that it is now, but I think it is always like that. I tend to prefer to carry the flame of the his of the greatness, the greatest moments of its history, and like sort of enjoy that the echoes of that in the halls of MIT. In the same way, in Boston, you think about the history, and that history lives on in the few individuals. Like you can't just look around what Boston is now and be like, "What has Boston become?" I think it was always carried by. to you like i think they've done studies where most people stop searching for new music after age 19 yeah. most dads you see like wearing super old clothes like the that's the style of the time period of the last great part of their life so like there's an evolution in in people and it, it could also be the memories of where they live like when i was 17 of course my neighborhood was the best then because i was having the most fun and we always kind of look at things through uh that that tint, I think. And you're right. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the way cities are evolving now. It's just not, um, I, I, I preferred a time of like a mom and pop store, not a fabricated like, uh, gastro pub that could just be like on a four lane super highway on your, on your way out of Epcot center. And it's, it's actually owned by like some conglomerate, but there's still the special places. Like I, this takes us back to the road trip is um, maybe I tend to romanticize the experiences of like the diners in the middle of nowhere. Uh, what would you say makes for like, 
it feels like life is made up of these experiences that are that maybe on paper seem mundane but are actually somehow give you a chance to pause and reflect on life with like a certain kind of pe- people whether like really close friends or complete strangers maybe alcohol is involved in the middle of nowhere it seems like road trip facilitates that if you allow it to like what do you think makes for those kinds of experiences have you had any i think in the context of a road trip i think it's like hyper localization and i think it is um those those experiences you know and then we we drove back to la when he got out in pennsylvania um but all the stops along the way were kind of like weird things like you have no money right so you're finding that like a little diamond in the rough place to eat the diner you talk about like that place i I once was in where was i i think i was in buenos aires and the guy that i was with he said i know this quaint little spot around the corner and i was young i was like 25 and i thought the coolest thing in the world would be to be such a citizen of the world that you know these quaint little spots around the corner in like all these great cities. Like I know where to get this great chicken sandwich in Argentina. I know where to get this great meal in Costa Rica. I know where to get this super local like um, egg in another country. I always thought that that was really cool. Like the, the ability to do that anywhere in the world. Did you get closer with that guy when uh, through the trip? I found that like, uh, so I took, I took a trip across the United States with a, uh, yeah but just uh basically trying to sleep with every kind of woman that this world has to offer what's the difference between those two things well i guess you're searching for the different kinds of meanings Uh (laughs) i i mean i just i i i still think that you can't find meaning between a woman's legs i suppose uh that maybe have you tried all of them (laughs) uh but i there was a tension there we grew closer with those experiences but we've gotten in fights you know there was a lot of like literal almost fights and then we were close and there was like silences but then we were like brothers and this whole weird journey of friendship that we went on i think anytime you spend that much time in uh like a small space with another person you're gonna have the the different parts of the relationship will manifest themselves you'll have the periods of closeness you'll have the periods of vulnerability where it's like maybe about probably more to the point of the friend that you drove with we were more about racking up experiences whatever they were right i want to be able to retell this Hmm. stories yeah, I want to be able to retell this. And it's got to sound cool. Like, I don't want to retell a story about, yeah, and then we drove through Alabama and they've got a lovely library and I checked out this book and, you know, I'm not interested in retelling that. Do you, do you remember any, um, well, this is a kid's show. Do you remember any stories that the kids would enjoy from those times um, that were profound in some kind of way? There were some... that's the beautiful thing about road trips when you're broke is like in retrospect everything turned out fine but you're facing the complete darkness the uncertainty of the possibilities laid before you and like i don't know if you were confident at that time but like i was really full of self-doubt like just like all i could see is all the trajectories where you just screw up your life like what am i doing with my life i'm a failure like all these dreams i've had i've never realized i'm a complete piece of shit all those I, kinds of i things. had no concept of consequence i i like i was i, I probably had toxoplasmosis <laughs> I, I had literally no concept of consequence immediate gratification was all i cared about oh so existentialist yeah it did not it did not even enter my mind at in my like early 20s that anything that I was doing at that point could reverberate for the rest of my life. I think part of me didn't even think I'd make it this far. Yeah. And so I was not interested in like the long play. I remember thinking like, why should I be acting now in a way that might impact a point in my life I never reach? Um, 
you think deeply about this world and in a philosophical context while also appreciating the violence of hurting other uh, friends of yours, right, on a regular <laughs> yes. basis. So what? Why, why do you think, I mean, maybe there's a broader question there, but also a personal question. It seems that people who fight for prolonged periods of time, like jujitsu people and more mixed. And how you've treated them. And I think that probably is what started the marriage of being kind of like a philosophical martial artist. You've got to really like on a daily basis, take stock of, of what's going on around you and inside you, because we all suffer with this kind of, uh, idea. If today's my last day, did I do it right? And we don't really do it so much nowadays because we're so comfortable, but if we were being marched out to war every day, I think you'd see people live a little bit differently. Uh, you know, and you they, you treat the people around you a little bit differently. Do you think there's uh, echoes of that in just even the sport of uh, like grappling and jujitsu, where you're facing your own mortality? We don't really think of it that way, but to be honest, I think that a lot of people that train in a martial art in contemporaries person but it does seem that if you do jiu-jitsu long enough it's very difficult not to fall into like this has become a personal journey an intellectual journey because like if you get your ass kicked thousands of times there's a certain point to where that maybe it's like a, a defense mechanism but that turns into some kind of deeply profound introspective experience versus like exercise that's not true. yoga <laughs> yeah so let me let me go back first and address the Instagram point, which I think there's a difference between people who whose Instagram is intrinsically tied to their profession and they have to put a specific profile out there. And I think in general, people who truthfully are t their business is tied to their Instagram profile, I want to exclude them. I think that most people, Instagram is how they want to be seen. And that's not always congruent with who you are, but I think there is a level of dishonesty there. Yeah. Like, this is how I want people to see me. I'm going to put all this stuff in my Instagram bio, but that's really not me. And when you do that, um, I think it's, it's a little disingenuous and you're right. There's not you're never really gonna marry those two things together and it gets tough. Let me, uh, sorry to interrupt, let me push back on something. Yeah. This is a good time to address uh, the, the the many flaws of the great and powerful John Clark. Okay, uh, let, 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 let's, let's go there, because it's, it's interesting. You strive so hard for excellence in your life and for extreme competence that you are, visibly and physically off put by people who are who have not achieved competence do you think we should be nicer to the people who are those early like you mentioned a uh, person who first picks up an art picks up uh, is becomes vegan starts doing crossfit start doing jiu-jitsu for the first time and create that as their you know they're they're struggling through this like who am I? And they're really overly proud and it's kind of ridiculous. And you and your wise chair have see, seen many battles. Old. Yeah. <laughs> that you see the ridiculousness of that. I tend to, I'm learning to give those folks, not to mock them, and, and to sort of give them a chance to do their ridiculousness. Let because I think I was that too. Let me first clarify. I want to be clear about what you mean when you say a level of competence. Now, I, uh, I've never won a world championship. I've never, you know, there are plenty of things in my life. I want to reach a level of competence in that. So the person that you have respect for is a person who takes it fully seriously, takes 
takes the effort fully seriously. So for base, that would be that you agree with yourself that you're going to perform live. And just in your own private moments, your private thoughts, you're not going to give yourself an excuse out like, I'm just gonna have fun, this is a nice experience. You're going to you're going to think, I'm going to try to be the best possible bass player given, given everything that's going on in my life, but I'm going to do my, like actually, yes. and put it all on the line. And if I fail, that is, that's not because I didn't try, it's because I'm a failure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, then, an, and then sit in that sick feeling of like, I'm a failure. But isn't that an important thing to know? No, absolutely. I, but there, there's a, there's a, that's like the best thing we could be. But sometimes it's fun to lose yourself in the, um, in the, in the bragging, in the, yeah. in the lesser ways of life. And I, I think, I'm careful not to, uh, because too many people in my life, when I brought them with like a little candle of a fire of a dream, they would just go like, you know, they would just blow that fire out. Uh, that they would dismiss me because they see like, you know, I would say, I've said, I've said a lot of ridiculous stuff, but the one, you know, I've always dreamed about uh, like putting a, I always dreamed of having this world full of robots. And, you know, every time I would uh, bring these ideas up, they would be shut down by the different people, by my parents, by, you know, uh, you know, they, you need to first get to get an education. You need to succeed in these dimensions. And in order to do all these things, you have to get good grades. You have to blah, 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 blah. Like, It's a it's a weird dance because of course the coaches will tell they'll kind of dismiss that mm -hmm. it's like okay okay uh, but at the same time it feels like in those early days you have to preserve that little little fire that's like Johnny Ive I don't know if you know who that is is a designer at Apple he was a chief designer he's okay. behind most of the iPhone all that stuff and he he always talked about that he wouldn't bring his ideas to Steve Jobs until they were matured because he would always shit on them. Uh, he he would he wanted them to like little, as little babies, like live for a little bit before they get completely shut down. And I always think about that when I see a beginner sort of bragging on Instagram, you have to be careful. You let, let them play with that little dream, you know? Are you playing with a little dream that you're nurturing? That's what I struggle with. Is it? I don't think it necessarily is. Certainly you're wrong. And when I say Instagram, I don't want to impugn a bunch of strangers, but I have a gym with a lot of members. And, and I can tell you that the number of years I've been in the gym, when someone comes to me and says, this is my goal, I don't, I don't tell them yes or no in general, but I know. I can tell by the way they say it to me, I can thin slice it. I've seen the look on people's faces. And when people start to like say they want to do X, Y, and Z, I know right off the bat, this person's either going to put an effort in or they're not going to put an effort in. So to me, it's about the effort behind that. If you're busting your ass and you're a newt at something and you're brand new, but you're working really hard and you have a series of like moderate successes in that like that's the guy i want to champion because that persistence and that grit over time those successes will n no longer be moderate they'll be huge but the person who's having moderate success by doing nothing chances are they'll never learn to put that work in and the successes will never grow the timeliness of his career and like the age i was when he like came to prominence um, the raw, brutal violence and the raw, brutal honesty when he speaks. I think it's easy for people to hear him or see his life and cast him aside as some Simeon-esque, uh, like just Cretan scourge on society. But when you hear him speak, like this is not a guy who's unintelligent. This is a guy who knows himself better than probably most of us know ourselves. It's disarming. And, uh, you know, that's a humongous part of my admiration for him. Who is Mike Tyson 
because you, there's it feels like there's similarity between him and you. There's a it feels like there's a violent person in that that person returned. It seems like for Mike Tyson, that person returned at the prospect of competition. It returns, but I've learned I've learned better how to manifest it in competition in terms of like the effects that that type of emotion has on you physically in the middle of a competition. So I've better learned how to utilize that energy. But I think another side effect of this is like having a gym where you're a bigger guy and you're the head instructor, you can't be as mean and violent as you once were because you're also now trying to run a business and you spend so long, so many, so many years trying not to be mean and to, you know, soften your, your technique a little bit, that that all of a sudden just becomes who you are. And and I don't necessarily like that. So I've been trying to reclaim that a little bit uh, on the mat. But I think in competition, there's, there has to be an athlete really wants to score the points. A fighter really wants to incapacitate you and put you in a position where they can do their own bidding and the result in a jujitsu match might just still be two points but the motivations are very very different what do you make of uh tyson on joe rogan saying that he was aroused by violence do you think that's insane do you think that's deeply honest for him and do you think that rings true for many of us others who practice this in different degrees I don't, I can't speak for a lot of people. And I think that it's, was a brutally honest statement by him. And I think it's something that even if a lot of people return and I wasn't trying to return you to the mat. I was actually trying to like drive you through the mat and through the ground. Like I took, like I, I, it gave me joy to do that. Yeah. Like it wasn't like I was trying to you know, just return you to the mat so that I could pin you. That what you just talked about, like the the dominating another person, I used to look at that as you've got someone who in theory is equally trained and equally skilled as you are, and you're you're absolutely out there totally dominating them. There's joy in that. You could get in an MMA fight and you could take someone down and you could mount them and all that feels great. But when you start raining down the punches on their face from Mount and like dropping elbows and stuff, like there's another level of satisfaction there. And it's it, it's tough to describe. And I don't think that it's everyone uh, is made for it. When I was, a, I think when I was a senior in high school, my wrestling coach said, look, you've got to stop with all this crazy aggressive wrestling. Like they, they try to turn me into a technician and and, and, it, and it and it did work to a degree. And it was a humongous shift for me in terms of success. But it wasn't the same level of enjoyment out of it. Um, like, I mean, I got disqualified from New England because my coach said crossfade. Something like that. I was, I was a lot of like... I mean, that, that's a weird American warrior ethos that I've picked up but i also have in me the the russian the Sitiev brothers that don't see it don't see it as that they they don't get draw they think that there is a tension between the art of the martial art and the violence of the martial art is i agree as a poetic way i could put it but they're not so fascinated with this dan gable dominating another human they think of the effortless the effortlessness of the technique and your mastery of the art is exhibited in its effortlessness how much you lose yourself in the moment and the timing that just the beauty of a timing like there's much more like one example in judo but also in wrestling you can look at the foot sweep a wrestler <laughs> I'm so I'm still trying to adjust. I've most of my life said Genghis Khan, but uh, the right pronunciation is uh, actually Chengis Khan. There's a uh, tension there. We kind of think I don't know. We I kind of thought as Genghis Khan is a ultra violent. 
a leader of ultraviolet men. But another view, another way to see them is the people who, warriors that valued extreme competence and mastery of the art of uh, fighting with weapons, with bows, with uh, horse riding, all that kind of stuff. And I'm not sure exactly where to place them on my sort of thinking about violence in in our human history. I think in uh, the context of like uh, combat sports, I think there's a difference between an athlete winning a contest under a certain set of rules and a fighter winning a fight under those exact same rules. There's a different approach to it. <clears throat> and I don't think one is any better than the other. Um, like in MMA, I think a great example would be George St. Pierre. George St. Pierre is a tremendous, it's a tremendous athlete. And he... Being able to talk about the beauty of a... a perfectly timed slide by mm -hmm. right there are other wrestlers that will never be able to pull that off and therefore they have to pursue other ways to, to defeat someone and maybe it is the dan gable breaking a man's spirit by outworking him type thing which is beautiful in its own way uh but we 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 tend to self-select the ways in which we're able to be successful and then kind of take a deep dive into that what do you think is more beautiful Brute force. I can't emulate those because I lack the physical ability to do that. Whereas I, I at least have a chance to emulate some of the people who do it through grit and through outworking people. But I would love to uh, return to Genghis Khan and get your thoughts about, like, I have so many mixed feelings about whether he is evil or not, whether the violence that he brought to the world had ultimately, the fact that it had maybe kind of uh, like Dan Carlin describes, cleansed the landscape. It's like a reset for the world through violence. Had whether you would sacrifice your way of like the pride of nations or the, the nationalism pride of your country whether you're willing to give that up uh for, for uh you know to survive it depends it, on who depends on you if you have a if you have a family and like young kids and stuff like that i think your your obligation is primarily to them and therefore surrender has to be something that you consider in that in that moment in time so that you can uh take care of those people if you're a man alone and you've got like all these principles and all this other stuff and you just don't you you're not down with what genghis khan is doing and what he's selling yeah try and escape do your thing and just know that you know what waits on the other side of that for you potentially but i think if there's someone else out there that depends on you your obligation should be to them it those for to preserve our survival and that applies in all forms like actual survival or like on, on social media like preserving your reputation all those kinds of things it seems like we in, especially in america value individual life life that death is somehow a really bad thing as opposed to saying sacrificing your principles is a very bad thing and everybody dies and it's okay to die as the, what's horrible is to sacrifice your principles of who you are just to live another day i think a big problem is people don't really even know what their principles are anymore right to stick by your principles one under i don't want to equate murder of in the Genghis Khan times to uh, social media cancel culture. But it certainly doesn't feel good when people are attacking on social media. No. And it does take a lot of integrity to, uh, without anger, without emotion, without, without being, uh, without mocking others or attacking others unfairly, 
standing by the ideas you hold, or in another way, uh, standing by your friends, standing by this little group. All their friends become really quiet and don't defend them. Or worse, I mean, quiet is at least understandable. They kind of signal that they throw them under the bus, I guess, uh, is one way to put it. And that that's something I think about a lot because from coming from me, it's like I I hold an ethic. I don't know if others hold this ethic. Maybe it's this like Russian uh, mobster ethic of like you should help your friends bury the body. You shouldn't criticize your friends for committing the murder. Like there are certain levels of like you know, yeah, you, you have that discussion after you buried the body that right. like, maybe you shouldn't have done that murder thing. Right. Uh, I don't know. You know, I understand that that's a problematic, um, with, with the terminology, <laughs> that's a problematic ethical framework within which to operate. But at the same time, it feels like what else do we have in this world except the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the love we have for a very small community but perhaps that's the wrong way of thinking. Perhaps the 21st century will be defined uh, by the dissipation of this community, of this loyalty concept. No, we're all just individuals. I think you're right. And I think you have to have some sort of core framework of principles and beliefs that you operate on. And I think when I was, what I was referencing is a little bit different. And But to speak to your point, you, you need a framework um, of core principles on which you can then base a lot of your other decisions. I've got probably three friends that if they called me right now and said, let's bury the body. Sorry, Lex, I got to go. There are other people in my life that if they said, uh, Hey, we've got to go bury the body. I would say, who is this? <laughs> you know yeah so i think it, it it depends on the relationship i wonder that's a good it's a really good measure i would love to have i would love that to be in your profile people put like pronouns i would love to put like honestly like objectively not self-report but objective how many people in your life if they committed murder, you would not ask any questions and you would help them hide the body. Right. Like I would love to know that number for people. Yeah. And and I think it's a weird thing too, because you think right away, like, okay, it must be the, the group of people that are the closest to you. That's right. who you're first thinking of, right? But obviously for like my best friend. Into like giving yourself to the other person that uh, creates a deep connection that makes life fulfilling, like meaningful, that doesn't exist if you don't take that leap. I mean, it's not about the murder. We're sort of focusing. I think that's a... Help you out, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. And you don't have that, that deep connection with those people. You mentioned uh, some principles that you've... Uh, change your mind on is there do you want to go there is there some interesting principles and the process of changing that uh is useful to talk about i can't really cite a specific thing except that understanding that for you and be okay with it mm -hmm. as opposed to being like no i gotta die with this I got to die with this. It's really liberating. There are definitely our ideas. You want to die on that hill and no one's ever going to change your mind, but it's really liberating to be confident enough to say, change my mind. I'm lucky enough to have some smart motherfuckers around me who can tell me, listen, you're being a total dipshit. Like, let's, let's rethink this. Or like I have one friend who does the five whys all the time and he loves backing me into a corner. And what's the five whys? You just like when someone makes a statement about something mm -hmm. to really get to the core issue, they say, if you ask why five times, mm -hmm. make a statement. Well, why is that? And you answer that. Well, why? 
and you phrase the why differently, obviously, but then you get to the core. They say five times you can get to the core of the issue. And uh, that's a challenging thing. But I find later in life, it's so liberating for me to be confident enough to be like, man, was I fucking way off the mark on this yeah. and have my mind and, changed. And be able to say that to others that I was wrong. Totally. That, that ability, and I, n- I never used to have that. And it's it feels real good and there's a hunger for that too um yeah if you're you're so right actually on a personal level it feels very good exactly as you said it's liberating because you're free to then think as opposed to defend yeah uh, without thinking yeah you get so sick of defending the same thing over and over and over and you start to think about it and it's like well I, I would really like to evolve my thought process here. And when you're constantly defending, you know, one point, it, it's difficult to let other ideas in. You 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 discount the possibility that you can have your mind change when you're constantly on the defense. Like you have to have a crack in, in the front line in order to let a new idea come in and possibly flourish. And maybe the new idea doesn't even prove your current belief system to be wrong, but maybe it's like the the water to a seed and it grows and now it's something even bigger and better. Yeah. And you can you can start to work with that instead. And it's a it's a tough thing because I'm a stubborn fuck and it's very difficult. Because they realize that there might be a better way, not because they realize that by changing their mind, they're going to get a new demographic to vote for them. Like, right. That's transparent as shit. Nobody wants to see that. Right. Like that's right. That's a person who can't separate the, their their position from their people they're supposed to be helping. Yeah, and you can usually smell that. That's uh, we're just talking uh, offline about. Uh, there's something about Hillary Clinton where she talked about changing her mind on gay marriage, yeah. that it felt like this is a political calculation versus like really deeply thinking about like what, you know, what things do we do in this world that violate basic human rights? Like really thinking about deeply. And, you know, of course, politicians are calculating. There's, but you can see it. You This, this is the thing. That's why I like... Um, as on the human level. Whatever, agree with him or not, it felt like he wasn't doing political calculation. He was just a human. He couldn't be further away from my pol- political ideals, but also, like, there's an obvious authenticity to his passion for what he's saying that is not present in other candidates. And you could see it all these people that have been in politics forever, like from all the way back when Hillary was a lawyer in the 70s. There's a couple of shots of her in the courtroom in the 70s, though. She's she's looking all right. She's got those big glasses on. Yeah. She's kind of a little bit of a nerdy babe back in the day. (laughs) Oh, you mean like... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, John Clark says uh, Hillary Clinton was a babe back in the day. 73 Clinton, yeah. (laughs) Uh, That's an interesting question about authenticity and politicians do you think like uh hillary clinton just the clintons in general are a good example of that why do you think they become over time so inauthentic is it the system that changes them is it their own hunger for power is it uh what is it or are they or were they always inauthentic well first i'd like to say that i don't know if you know this but i come from a, a bit of a political dynasty myself uh, I was on the student government several times in high school, and my dad won um, the runoff in a special election in Bradenton Beach, Florida. I think there's like 700 people there. I, I really liked Dan, especially like a year, year and a half ago. He seemed very level-headed. It's more attention and the higher regard you're held in in your community and the more sycophants 
like continue to blow smoke up your ass, the more it changes the way you present yourself. And you can see it in, in every walk of life. I mean, jujitsu is a tiny, tiny little section of the world, but you see it in the jujitsu community when someone all of a sudden starts a social media page or whatever, and they get a bunch of people like basically like, you know, cyber filleting them on their Instagram page. They, they, they change. Filleting. Is that a word? I, I think so. So it giving fellatio. Yeah. So filleting. Yeah. Jamie, look it up. <laughs> I think, but in those people, they, they, it changes their character. Yeah. It changes who they are because they become emboldened and, and, you know, now they've got this like mythical cyber mob behind them. There's a sign at the entrance to your gym that reads, for every moment of triumph. It's a quote by Hunter S. Thompson. It reads, for every moment of triumph, for every instance of beauty, many souls must be trampled. What does this quote mean to you? That quote to me is about, mostly about sacrifice. And it's about to achieve anything great or anything beautiful or to triumph. You have to have sacrificed so many things to get there, unless you're the most unbelievably genetically gifted person in the world and greatness is just you know falls upon you it's just raining from the sky i think on your path to greatness on your path to success and triumph you leave a lot of carnage in your wake personal relationships other goals things that you didn't pursue um you know other unfulfilled dreams and you kind of have to sell a lot of that out in order to be really the the at the the peak of your field or or what you want to be um i know that that's happened in my life i mean there's tons and tons of relationships that you know couldn't survive the way that i was living my life because when i was trying to be a, a big time fighter or like when i was just training all the time tons of relationships uh dissolved themselves naturally some not so naturally uh, some people get it. Some people don't get it. Some people. Sort of go all in on the, whether it's stupid or not to go all in on something that the, the possibility, the, the possibility of creating something beautiful is there. Who says it's stupid. If you're going all in on it, you don't think it's stupid. Someone else might think it's stupid, but I mean, who really cares? Well, I'm of many minds on many things. So I feel like there's certain minds, certain moods of the day where you think it's stupid. Like relationships is a beautiful one, which is, uh, you've seen the movie Whiplash by any chance? Yes. It seems like in a man's life, or it could be a, a woman's, but I am i don't identify as a woman. So I know the man, the, the lived It's I 2020, could. bro. But my lived experience for now is that of a man. We'll see about tomorrow. And there is, in the pursuit of excellence, there's often a choice of uh, some of the souls that must be trampled are personal relationships with humans in your life that you might deeply care about. It could be family. It could be friends. It could be loved ones of all different forms. It could be the people that your colleagues that uh, depend on you, people who will lose jobs because of the decisions you make, all this kind of stuff. It seems that that. And he chooses, not chooses, he naturally makes the decision to sacrifice the romantic relationship with the woman in, in further pursuit of this chaos of this chaotic pursuit of excellence. And it feel that doesn't feel like a um, deliberate decision. It feels like a giant mess of like an emotional mess where you're just like kind of like a fish swimming against stream, just like, fuck it. You let go of all the things that convention says you should appreciate. You, th you throw away the possibility of a stable life, of a comfortable life, of uh, uh, what society says is a meaningful life. 
and just pursue this crazy thing full of tox seeming toxicity with crazy people surrounding you. I don't know. So I don't know what the right decision is. Like part of my brain says you should stay with the girl. Uh, fuck that instructor that's making you, uh, that's pushing you to to places where it's like that are destructive, potentially destructive. Like could lead to suicide. Could lead you to uh, completely. Uh, uh fail or fail on your pursuit of excellence or destroy the possible the destroy the dream the passionate pursuit of the thing that you've always dreamed for in that case is drumming i don't know i'm on many minds there like what is the right thing to do so my first two thoughts are number one fuck convention what is convention? It's like a, some laid out paths, path, some linear progression of the way your life is supposed to go. Like, you know, that someone can draw a picture of at the end. That shit's, that, first of all, it's just boring and whatever. And it's, it's, I don't want to say that it's cowardly because it isn't cowardly, but. I'm like some sort of like chauvinistic king of the castle type shit, like where everyone should cater to you. But the fact of the matter is, uh, that person is a compliment to your life and helping you do your thing. And in your own way, you're helping them to achieve whatever their goals are. Also, it's uncommon that you have two people under the same roof striving to be unbelievably excellent in one small area. It's not impossible, but it's uncommon. Like relationships have to be like binary systems, like two stars, like the gravitational pull is what keeps you together and circling around one another. Right. And, and, you know, one is bigger than the other and they'll fluctuate and, you know, the stars will get bigger and they'll get smaller and they'll contract based on positioning and, you know, composition that that's the way a relationship should be. Not an asteroid coming in to disrupt you know, your the the surface of your planet. Yeah. It's a binary system. It's a compliment. That girl was the wrong girl for him. So you shouldn't uh like the big unconventional dream. By the way, somebody who's uh you have uh, you have recently gotten well recently in the span of the history of the universe is recently you've gotten to a relationship, but you haven't always you have not felt the need to be in the relationship just because you're supposed to by society's kind of Correct. momentum. If you you're never all in on the thing you're trying to do. Um a relationship has to complement your life. You can't say it's okay to want to be in a relationship, but you can't want to be in a relationship so bad that you take someone in who fits the suit and it's like, Oh, our schedules kind of work out. You live near me and this and that and the other thing, because the logistics of a relationship are not always perfect. It's what matters is when the two people are together. That's the perfect part of it. And it's great to want to meet people and say, if we meet and some sort of a relationship develops, I'm willing to run with it but I'm not meeting you hoping a relationship develops. I think you kind of put the cart before the horse in a lot of those situations. It's like when guys meet, like no guy goes out and is like, I'm looking for a bro, right? <laughs> Nobody does that. You go to the gym and you run into a bunch of dudes and the next thing you know, someone's cool. Do you think uh, makes a successful relationship if we can linger on that a little longer? like? Let me ask John Clark about love. I didn't ask a question, but let me just say love. About love. <laughs> uh, are you one of those people who never says, I love you? No, no. I'm an extreme person. And uh, like my emotions are also extreme. Mm -hmm. And one of the things uh, I concern myself with, uh, maybe this is philosophical and martial arts warrior soldier type related stuff is like, I don't want anyone. If I die tonight on the drive home, 
hopefully that doesn't happen. I hope that no one is left questioning how I felt about them. And people I don't like probably are not questioning that. And so the, the thing that I've had to learn how to do later in life is to tell the people that you care about that you care about them. And, um, putting to the person receiving that message. And when you tell someone how much you care about them, it can also be off putting to the person, uh, depending on how they view their relationship with you, but it's still important to get it out there. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't hold those things in because you're worried about how they'll be received or if they'll come back at you. So you're okay going all in. When someone knocks your your knocks you on your ass and they come into your life mm-hmm. and you're flush with all these emotions, you're not worried about Oh, I don't really like commitment. No, because they've knocked you on your ass. You want to be with them. You want those things. The the two most alive points in your life I think people feel is the euphoria of a new relationship and the and then the loss when that love is gone. You know, like you'll never feel more, I don't think, than in those those moments in in your life. See, the nice thing about the loss is it lasts longer. Yeah. And it, it <laughs> so that's a Louis C.K. point that he makes, which is like uh, that. That like uh, he, in his show, I think, is a conversation with an older gentleman that says like that's his favorite part of the relationship is that period between the loss of the relationship and the real death. is as fulfilling as the actual like love the the early infatuation which is interesting i also think of the bukowski i return to that there's a little clip of him in an interview Uh, is something else so love is only a temporary thing which is interesting i think some people say that's cynical I don't know. I don't know what to think of it. I think it's important to understand that everything is fleeting when you don't put effort into it. Almost everything will be fleeting. If you don't put effort into it, most people will get fat and lazy. If you don't put effort into something, you're going to not be good at uh, playing guitar or playing bass. You've got to put effort into it. The same thing goes for a relationship. That the The awesome part of it, that like love part, that dies soon and early on in a relationship because it's so good that we think we don't have to work at it, but you do, you have to like keep doing the things and you got to keep start like farting and stuff. Like that's when it all dies. Yeah. That's when it dies. You know, we're all human beings. We all, you know, have, you know, we're all here and our bodies work in the same way, but like, you start to chip away at this like beautiful thing when you, when you stop, when you buck conventional courtesy and, and things like that. We take it for granted. Basically. You take it for granted. Yeah. I mean, that's the same thing with life. Uh, it's like, it's the same. I'm a big fan of meditating on death that you could die today Mm -hmm. in the same way you should meditate on like this relationship could end today. This connection with another human could be. This is the last time you could uh, you could be interacting. Yeah. And Six BC, no one even showed up to fight him in the pancreation event. Nobody even showed up because he was fucking everybody up. Yeah. <clears throat> Years later, he was retired, and uh, this crazy Macedonian dude came there at some dinner for you know alexander the great everyone's chilling drinking you know whatever they were drinking out of their chalices and this macedonian dude threatened him and challenged him so dioxypus said yeah man we'll throw down and you know they set the time and the place macedonian dude comes out like body armor uh and then didn't even kill him in the a show of ultimate power 
for the time. So I think there's something about the guy being naked too is just extra demeaning. Extra demeaning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can, 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 <laughs> can we rephrase the question then? Because those are clearly going to be some probably forgotten warriors in history. Well, let's take it to like modern day mixed martial arts in the UFC, perhaps. Well, just mixed martial arts there. Who do you think are the top fighters of all time? What metrics would you consider in, in, trying to answer this perhaps unanswerable question i think one of the things you want to think about is a uh, uh, strength of opponent at the time you fought them so for example fighting bj penn in his prime and beating him is far different than beating bj penn last year right so to say you have a victory over bj penn is not the same given the, the time uh, frame of when it happened not to take anything away from anyone who's beaten bj penn uh, just use that as an example of someone whose career went into a, a different direction. Yes. I would say the guy who I think is probably the best that people are the least familiar with would be Marilla Bustamante. And I think he was a guy who was one of the guys with the first really good physical build for MMA, which I think is narrow from the chest to the back and long shoulder to shoulder and kind of sinew. Requires both the, the skill and the opportunity and to the meet other, each other. And when you talk about a fighter, the other thing that really a good fighter needs to become great is a foil. Yeah. And so many fighters don't have a foil. That's one of the biggest attractions, I think, of early Mike Tyson's career. He didn't have a foil. He had no one driving him. And by the time he did, by the time he had a foil in Holyfield, his career was in a different place. But he, he's one of the greats of all time, and he never really had a foil. So his greatness was in the un, unparalleled destruction of, like, nobody's. Right. Well, in not, you know... Uh, of lesser opponents right and so when people uh debate the you know the level of greatness of mike tyson that's one of the things they say like he didn't fight a lot of killers in their prime i think you've obviously got to say in that conversation i have a really difficult time keeping george st pierre out of the con conversation uh only because he was able to beat you with anything he could he could out jab you he could out wrestle you and he could he could submit you the problem i have with fedor is his career also took a, a drastic turn towards the end and when he was fighting in pride he was doing a lot more grappling and then he just started casting that overhand right at people mm -hmm. And his game kind of changed at that point. Uh, you can't take anything away from his greatness, but at that time, the great heavyweights were not really uh, in, in fighting in pride, and they didn't really exist yet. And by the time he fought a really good one, Fabricio Verdum, he did get submitted there. Does does his later performance color our your and our perception of his greatness? Uh, um, like uh, in general about fighters not mine but i'm someone who's like intimately involved in the sport but it colors everyone else's same with anderson silva like i don't think anderson silva doesn't want to fight in like seven years or something or is like yeah. one like that's a guy who in his prime was one of the best fighters ever. is he in the top five for you i think he's probably in the top five yeah greater striker of all time or no in mma and uh, in mixed martial arts in mixed martial arts <laughs> That's a tough question. The greatest MMA striker of all time. Because, like, the timing. It's got to be Anderson Silva. And I think you have to consider discussing Leota Machida for his unbelievable manipulation of distance. Yeah. Which is something that people don't really talk too much about in terms of fighting, unless you're someone in the sport. Yeah, the, his his use of distance and the ability to like what we call pop out, like and make you miss by one inch, so that he could follow your fist back in as you retract it and then hit you over the top. That that's a thing of beauty. Anderson Silva, when he became a counter striker, when he got to his prime in the UFC, that was a thing of beauty. 
That was a thing of beauty. Um, so I think definitely those two guys and Marilla Bustamante's got to be. Uh, <clears throat> Vince McMahon from the WWE, he said, you know, the difference between what we do and what uh, UFC does is that when we have a superstar, I can make sure he stays on top until he's no longer a superstar because we have predetermined results. Yeah. The UFC can't do that because they're actually having fights. Well, it's true and false. You can't do that. But you can give your superstars the most favorable matchups to keep them on top for the longest. So people always talk about title defenses as if the guy they're fighting, the challenger, is always the person most deserving of the shot. Yeah. And it's just not true. So I don't put that much stock in it. Uh, against the beat Magomed Sharp Sharapov, where you on one side you have where how much weight does toughness have when you're thinking about the criteria when you define a great fighter? That's 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 a good question, and I don't have the answer to it. I admire the underdog that rises to the occasion through brute force. They didn't have, they didn't bring the skill set to the table that perhaps some of the greats have, but they rose to the occasion. I mean, there's something about that. There's something about that. And so now we're more talking about like uh, the internal attributes as opposed to the external physical attributes. And those are the things I think that you cannot teach. Those things you you come in the door and you either have that or you don't. I think, and we talk about this all the time, and this is one of the things where my mind changes regularly. Like on what makes a fighter, is it is it born or is it bred? And this week I'm of the opinion that uh, it's in you. And maybe it's in you and you suppress it and people can. How to beat to beat. Um, Which is which is uh, pressure him and try and drag him into the late rounds. You notice that later on when uh, Calvin Cater fought him, they wouldn't give him five rounds. They wanted five rounds, and Zabit's camp, from what I understand, would not agree to the five-round fight. Well, he didn't look... Right, so with Kyle, it was a three-round fight. Three-round fight. And what did... Uh, it went to decision? It went to decision. Did, Zabit won the decision, clearly. Which what, is, did Kyle have a shot of winning in the third round? I don't remember the exact score, but Kyle could have won the third round had he done a couple things differently. But I do believe in the fourth round, I think Kyle would have won a fourth won. round, and I think maybe even won the fight And if there would have been a fifth round. And he was pressing forward right. uh, like... ...area where you're going to out-technique him. And so we've got to now channel some of that grit that we know you have. This is an opportunity to showcase it. And I don't know how long I did it for, but because um, Kyle's much shorter than Zabit. So for a good long while, while we were training for Zabit, I didn't even say anything. And I just had clips of Mike Tyson training on the TV in the gym and the head movement. Yeah. And I didn't even mention it. And then we started to like get into it. And talk about, you know, getting inside the length of the longer fighter and uh, things like that. And we we kind of, which when some people train MMA, they say, okay, this guy's a really good wrestler. Let's think about avoiding the wrestling or being a better wrestler. And I think that when the difference in skill is so great, those are both the wrong answer. If a guy who's a really good wrestler wants to take you down and you don't have a lot of wrestling experience, he's probably going to get you down if he's got a good coach, right? So you have to deal with get-ups and breaking the hands from the various takedowns. Like it's, It was a while ago now, so I don't remember exactly the techniques we worked on. But we concentrated on defend the first takedown and stay out of the chain. Don't get chained into a bunch of wrestling techniques because you will be out-wrestled. Um, and that was really successful. And then in the third round, uh, Zabit was tired and, uh, he was tired. He Zabit got tired. He cuts a tremendous amount of weight. Yeah. Like I, I can't see him staying at 145 forever when they start giving him five round fights. I don't even know if he's had a five round fight yet. He may have, but, um, I, I can't see him staying down there. He's he, the guy's like six one. Yeah. The guys, he's a, he's a giant of a guy. So 
Kyle pressed forward there and he said uh, he felt that there was no power left in Zabit's hands. And so he felt fine. And I think part of it was he fed off the crowd as he moved forward Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, saw that he wasn't taking a lot of damage. Like the punches weren't stinging him. He started walking right through him. It it goes to your question of what makes a fighter. Was the him walking forward like that something that you're born with, or is that something you were training? Is that is no. that the Mike Tyson on TV? He's born with that. Kyle is born with that, and the crowd. I I've been in. Was a it lot, in Boston? No, it was in New York. It was in- happy that there could be things that he could have done to win the fight it's in retrospect i think that at that time we were playing with incredible house money like kyle was a gigantic underdog in that fight Zabit was unstoppable i think people were probably picking him to finish the fight in round one yeah. i think at that point no one had ever gone the distance with Zabit, yeah and no one certainly had you know put that kind of performance together and i think kyle uh kyle put the blueprint out there and in retrospect, when I look at the last round, yeah, there were things that could have been done differently, but we're playing with house money at that point. Like, I mean, let it fly. You you, you get to a point where you've got it. You're down three rounds and there's 20 seconds left. You got to move all your chips to the center of the table and, you know, see what happens. Do you remember what, what Joe Rogan said about it? I, I, I remember like he got one over. I think I have trouble remembering because offline we talked about that fight and he's exceptionally impressed by, I mean, Joe's from Boston. So it's like, yeah, I mean, there, there's a story there. I, you, okay. It, it sucks. Not, you naturally want to romanticize. Like there's a Rocky versus like, uh, right. there's Drago. a Rocky for you. Drago. Yeah. I mean, um, similar, I suppose, kind of chemistry, Kyle's style represents the American yeah. ideal, right? The spirit. Yeah, I mean, he's from Gloucester. American. It's like you could have you could have dragged him off the docks like yeah. three hours before the fight and said, "Hey, you want to go fight?" And yeah. he would have said yes. Yeah. Oh man, that was a special fight. But that's as per a discussion of like greatest fighters of all time. I tend to believe that that fight is more special than the. don't think so i think that was the greatest fight like if you want to rank fights i've ever seen yeah. i think to me that was the greatest fight i've ever seen it certainly was a uh one of the greatest displays of like just dogged effort from an underdog who was out experienced and and probably outsized but i mean like you just kyle's one of those kids you're never going to tell him he's out of a fight he has something you can't teach and I've seen tons of people with more physical attributes and they're just mental midgets and they got a million dollar body and a 50 cent heart. And, and, and Kyle is not that. Yeah. And- I mean, the, the tragic aspect of that is, um, like, I guess Kyle lost, right? Right. So like, if you look at the record and all the kind of things, Perhaps, uh, like, you look at the career, maybe, like, as a financial, from a financial perspective, that perhaps is not uh, the the greatest thing for Kyle's career or that, or in, in, yeah, in, a, in, a, in the history of the UFC, perhaps it's not, it's not, um, you know, like, maybe many people didn't even watch that fight, but it was a special moment that stands in the history. There's not many of these in uh, in the history of fighting, so. But at the end of the day, when you look at someone's career in the UFC, like, financially, there's a, you know, a handful of people that make real money. Everybody else makes nothing. Yeah. There's a handful of people that make real money. So did, did that loss cost him in the in the near term? Sure. But when you look back on your life, you're not going to look back on that loss as something that derailed my life financially and I never recovered from it. That's not going to happen. It, like the sad thing is, is, unless you were a champion and, you know, most, most people are going to be forgotten right after they're gone. Most people will be forgotten. And if you're not forgotten, certainly your your accolades are going to be misrepresented. Either they're going to be inflated or diminished one way or the other. So looking back on it, it's just so hard to 
to quantify that, but it's an experience in like when you're in that moment and you're one of the people like intimately involved in it, like the value of that experience supersedes any financial gain. Where would you put Khabib in the discussion of the greatest of all time? So you recently, we were together, we watched the fight um, of him and um, Justin Gaethje and, and Khabib retired. Would you put him up there as, as some of the, as one of the greatest or did he never truly find his foil that like the great warrior that challenged him? And, um, and maybe do, do you want to, do you think he's fully retired now? To answer the question about being fully retired, I don't have any idea. I can't for a second pretend to um, think that I understand the way that people from that part of the world think and respect their family and things like that to an American who says, oh, I promised my mom I wouldn't do it. I mean, I promised my mom I wouldn't do a lot of things. And I wouldn't. Conor McGregor. Uh, but you know uh what is it football is a game of inches yeah uh, there's there's a sense where you know that connor there's an argument to be made that connor wasn't exactly dominated that he ended up being dominant meaning let me phrase it differently is there's a lot of points in the fight that it could have uh a different trajectory right could have happened so he wasn't so far from having a chance at winning that fight it's just the end you can focus Those are the most important moments at the end you've yeah. lost the most important moments right but the road less taken it could have been if he didn't lose those very important moments he had a chance so i'm saying out of all the people that could be fought it's arguable that connor was up there of the people that had a chance let me say this first. <clears throat> I love get so much heat for this. I do love Khabib. Uh -huh. I'm a huge Khabib fan yeah. because I'm a grappler yes. first and foremost. Me too, because I'm also Russian. I love Khabib. Calm down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but when when what you're saying about if this happened, if that happened. But I mean, you could say that about every single combat sports event ever. If Spinks's hook land, landed on Tyson, maybe that fight didn't end the way that it did. But you know what? It didn't. You're absolutely right. But if we could talk about just Conor McGregor for a second. I can't wait to get your fan mail or hate mail. <laughs> um, speak to the innovation of Conor. I don't hear very many people making this argument, but is it possible to make an argument that Conor McGregor is one of the greatest fighters of all time? It's an interesting argument. And the problem, the only problem with the argument is there's so much emotion on either side. Yeah, I had a conversation, sorry to interrupt, with uh, Yaron Brook, who's a, a philosopher, objectivist, and which is... <laughs> in Con conor mcgregor i think first to i'll answer in two parts i think well i'm not going to answer the first part it's just a comment because you didn't ask the question what was the question i don't even remember uh, it's about the, the the how conor mcgregor fans are very emotional and conor mcgregor detractors are very emotional yeah. i think fans become very emotional they become <laughs> you know what some people know and some people don't know is that Connor's base is in karate and the karate style of Connor McGregor, Stephen Thompson, um, of Lyoto Machida, that type of distance management. A lot of times we think as martial artists, we think that the sport version of the art we've chosen to pursue somehow taints the authenticity in the, in the effectiveness of it. But point karate is what led to that in and out distance management style of Connor, of Leota, and of Stephen Thompson. They all kind of use it a little bit differently, but they use it very effectively, all three of them. And that comes from uh, a world of trying to kind of like uh, step in, land contact on you for my point, and then get back out before you can counter strike me. 
right? And that's where that comes from. Connor is blessed to have uh, longer arms than someone his height, probably. His movement, his distance, and the way he sets people up for the straight left hand while you're circling away from it and he can still land it, which is what he did to Chad Mendes. Hit him with a straight left while he was circling away from it. His losses have been uh, to jujitsu guys or grapplers, but they've been to really good guys. Mm -hmm. Like anyone who's going to sit here and tell me Conor McGregor is not a good grappler, go grapple him. Yeah. Let me see you grapple him. To that point, I'll also. Nate Diaz didn't fight that off because he knew he was so much better at jujitsu off the bottom that he didn't even care if he got swept. So is Conor McGregor innovative? Absolutely. Um, is he one of the best fighters ever? It's tough to say because he's such a cash cow that he was fed people. I firmly believe. And so like when he did, uh, I was like, I had to like, my, my, I had to, <laughs> my brain was like, like there's something broken. It was like shut down, like on windows, like froze. Mm -hmm. We have to rethink this. Like, this is a special human. Now, people who argue he's not even in the running of, like, top 20 is, you know, if you look at the number of defenses, for example, of his belt that he right. had, very, very little. But, like, to me, I'm one of those people, Is back to our discussion of, like, do moments make great fighters? I, I think just being able to be Jose Aldo, in his, I would argue, in his prime, some people might disagree, in this... uh in in a way where he like figures out the puzzle gets in his head the entirety of the picture and then to be i mean eddie alvarez would he be considered a really good, strong wrestler right like like or um not not strong wrestler strong striker and wrestler the, the whole combination of it and also uh what's the other wrestler he fought uh, chad mendez chad mendez so l l let me comment on all those if i may so i was at the chad mendez fight live yeah and um, there was, it was a little bit out of shape. Whatever, you still got to fight the fight. But I don't, I don't want to use that fight as evidence to Connor's greatness because you know they pulled Chad Mendes in. All he was like hunting and drinking beers in the woods and was a little out of shape. Yeah. But if you want to talk about greatness, like that surpasses your in. nearly as much as Khabib, but he he's a true martial artist. I, I, I think he respects his opponents despite the talk. I if maybe I'm misreading it, but it feels like he is a storyteller like uh Chael Sonnen type of like he's constructed this image to tell to uh to play the story like just the way he acts after the fight the honor he shows to his opponents. Yeah. There's a real martial arts in there. And to dismiss the fact that uh, the, the the story of the fight is part of it. Because he doesn't just shit talk. This is what people don't seem to understand. He's good at shit talking. Very good. He insulted... Jose Aldo and his country so much that he knew Aldo was going to come forward right into that left hook. Was that fight in Brazil, by the way? Do you remember? I don't recall. Because I know he insulted all of Brazil, but yeah. I'm not sure if yeah. it was in Brazil. But when he tried to do that to Khabib, you could tell that he just was not going to get in Khabib's head. Khabib was unflappable. Yeah. But there is, there is definitely something great about how he moves people. You know, the Irish are, are like, I mean, Connor's walkout music like for people from Ireland and of Irish descent, like that shit is like very deep. Yeah. You know, that it's very emotional song. I was, uh, to be honest, a little bit upset with Khabib that he didn't. Small town boy with the small town values of family and all those kinds of things. There's a moment where you inspire entire nations like the step up and be the foil to the to to the great Conor McGregor, where the 
where also Khabib becomes the foil to like like both both of them are the foil to each other and become like that fight was already a great fight, right? But it could have been something historic. Ali versus Fred. I mean, it could have been really historic. And I would argue, I'm, uh, I guess the biggest disappointment I have, and I understand it, and I also honor it as a martial artist, but to uh, I'm disappointed that Khabib doesn't seem to even consider the possibility of doing in Moscow mm -hmm. fight number two. So, and because that could be narrative wise, if they do it right, that's one of the could be one of the greatest fights in history. Yeah, I think in terms of Khabib and uh, inspiring uh, a country, is it possible? My fellow comrades, no, uh, is they love that, they love, yeah. they love that, but. They, uh, there's also a brash beer chugging shit talking thing that people really like about Connor, and I, I do love that. But I, the beautiful narrative would have been the clash, the real clash of those cultures. So, Khabib chooses to live the culture by walking away. There's also like a clash of them, sort of wa walking, not walking away from the fire, but walking into the fire. <laughs> You're a promoter's dream because you want the rematch. And the, and the only thing that makes more money than the rematch is the trilogy. You got to split the trilogy, split the, the, the rematch. You hope Connor wins. And then you had the trilogy fight and you, now you're all yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't get into Khabib's head, uh, head, but I know Putin, just the game, the entirety of it, especially at the time, especially if it was Trump as president, uh, if he was as president at the time and and Putin and in Russia and just knowing how masterful Connor is at like because Connor would would be a different Connor. I think he would be a calmer Connor. Mm -hmm. Like there would be a different uh right. like because you don't want to be over the top Connor with the Russian people. <laughs> right. No, that's <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's like uh it's when dangerous Kyle ground. To beat, that's that was the episode in the hotel in Brooklyn yeah. when um, some of the Russian guys confronted uh, Artem yeah. and then Connor came over. It's not. It, but... like, pe people take some of that shit in different parts of the world very, very seriously. Yeah. But that's what makes it beautiful. That's, uh, that's what makes a great story. And I think fighting is very much about the stories not just about the 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 particular outcomes of a fight or the skill set matching or like the chess of the of the fight. It's also about the story uh, of the greater like context of societies of warring. We're like warring cultures. We're still yeah. we're still good. We're <laughs> we're no longer can have great big hot wars between nations because of nuclear weapons. This is our. We can't even begin to understand what those people are fighting about over there. Yet, yet everyone sitting in America on their couch has an opinion. Like you can't even begin to understand it. I, I sure can't. Yeah, it's back to the principles discussion when, right. um, when, when what's violated is much deeper than just kind of um, anything we can even. In, in a middle class existence right. can't even comprehend a lot of times american soldiers will go to war because that's what they're told to do and they might maybe they disagree with the orders and maybe they agree with the orders but i get a sense that people in the middle east fighting all believe in what they're fighting for it's yeah. not it's not a thing where they're told to go do it i believe they're they really believe that what they're doing is the right thing and they're defending some sort of principle are you generally optimistic about the future, speaking of war, of human civilization, do you think will, uh, like, you know, people talk. All those kinds of things. It's It seems to be that uh, the argument that we 
go, are going to destroy ourselves in some kind of creative way very shortly is uh, not too crazy of an argument to make. Are you more optimistic or pessimistic about the prospects of human civilization in maybe the 22nd century? Like, is it possible that your generation is the last generation to be alive on Earth? No, but I wouldn't say that five generations from now that won't be that that could be true. I guess I think of it really selfishly. I, I'm a big believer that when your time here on Earth well, coming back together in in a more uh, impactful human way in person, touching, feeling, um, talking face to face. So all the things you're describing is what we had, as you mentioned before, when you were like a teenager. Yeah. So the state of the world, but that's right. because your mind was formed then. It, it very well could be, it very well could be. It's very possible that the virtual reality worlds that we'll create will be actually a much higher level of existence. In fact, like now we're getting, we're moving slowly away from tribalism perhaps you could argue the ideas of nations and we're going we're moving into the realm of ideas and it's got benefits and what and will help people but is it going to help the things that you find valuable like was it going to help commerce okay sure is that the thing you find the most valuable is it going to help communication well it'll help disseminating information is it going to help explain the information you're disseminating probably not is it going to hinder interpersonal communication absolutely and those are things i find valuable interpersonal communication talking to people like the, the like it saddens me when I go into a restaurant and there's five-year-old kids who like, you know, slamming away on an iPad and can't make eye contact with anybody or teenagers who don't say please and thank you when they order from the waitress. Like that to me is wrong. That shit's wrong. And I don't know this for a fact, but I do attribute that to, you know, using technology as a crutch when we're reading. What are the good things that are going to come out of it? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get my package in two days instead of four days. Does that make my life better? I try to, uh, I try to deeply empathize with a lot of experiences of other people. And like one of the things I love, like the smell of paper books and books in general. And early on, this is like five years ago, I just gave away all my books and I said, you know, I'm really going to try to fall in love with the books in the same way I did before, but now with a Kindle or not a Kindle, like paper white, whatever, the right. e-book e e reader. E-reader. E -reader. And um, I'm still not there, but I've been kind of trying to f fall in love with that experience. And in the same way I try to think like, teenagers are really into TikTok now, like making these short videos. I try to consider the possibility that their existence will be a much happier one than I've had. Mm -hmm. Is so short, they don't really deeply think or deeply experience things. They construct a, a social layer that they present to the world and they work on creating this social layer, like the presentation to the world, much more than really sitting alone with their thoughts and the sadnesses and their hopes and dreams and fears and like working on the project that is their, their own like actual person that exists in this physical world as opposed to working on the project of a particular social platform that they show but like perhaps that project like who cares who is reality right yeah. so how other people perceive this constructed thing that's their reality of you yeah. but is it your reality like that i mean like we said earlier it's what what you want, how you want people to see you is very rarely in line with how you really are or how you see yourself. And I mean, I can remember being like a 13 year old kid. And like, when you go through a bunch of, you know, weird 13 year old kid shit, like sitting in my room, like turning a red light on and listening to like a sad record. How to get to the root of the problem and learn about themselves. I don't know what future social networks are exactly. I do know on a shallow level, it does feel good when somebody clicks like on something. I think that is more of a drug than an actual deep 
long lasting, fulfilling happiness, but perhaps there's a way to make a social network that does lead to long lasting happiness that's somehow detached from the physical meat space. I don't know, but it feels like you want to give that a chance. Do you think when people are liking things on social media, do you think there's just a group of people, an overwhelming majority of people that are going to like whatever you put out there, they're clicking like, and then there's another section of people that just constantly scroll and like, scroll and like, and scroll and like, like, do you think when you get a like on content you put out that that like perhaps came from someone who normally I got you, bro. Yeah, I got you, bro. Yeah. Yeah, like f fist bump, like, yeah, we're in this fucking thing together. Mm -hmm. This whole thing doesn't make any sense, but we're in this together. And I, I think, yeah, it's possible for likes to be that. I, I don't think the actual clicking of a like, I think social media at its best might be that, where it's like, I got you, bro, at a, at a large scale, as opposed to kind of uh, this weird, uh, crazy pool of dopamine where everyone's just obsessed with there's the likes and likes and and then the, the division drives like more of this like weird anxious engagement i think that's just the dark version of it in the early days of social media i think you called it uh a battleground of ideas but i think social media is nothing but a battleground of fragile egos well but humans are fragile egos uh, i mean Maybe, but I think the people, I think particularly on social media, they're the most fragile. Like, would you be doing all the things you're doing? What What would you be doing if you weren't, um, if you weren't podcasting and posting the things you do on social media? What would you be doing? You'd probably be much the same guy, mm -hmm. right? But I think that on social media the fragile ego people, what you see on social media is not what they'd be doing without social media. Does that make any sense? Like you're, you're probably, your mission is probably somewhat congruent in your path. Yeah. But it's, it, the other side works too. I think there's also the people who are on social media, like fronting, like they're these positive figures and like, you know, oh, go into the gym, like whatever it is, the positivity that they yeah, yeah. spew out. But in real life, they're the most negative fucks you've ever met in your yeah. life. And they're just so full of crap. And it's just you, people playing to an audience. It's like you, like you said, like they, they, it's like a politician sometimes. Yeah. Like a politician wakes up one day and they decide, who's the group I can pander to the best to get the most. My marketing team, and I just feel that... Uh, uh love has the uh the best um what do you call it no i don't know there's a lot of people that accuse me of being like exactly that which is like why are you always being positive it's like well because i i'd like to be that yeah but i don't i wouldn't consider you someone who pan people are trying like I, I i tend to believe that people want to be good like the like they want to be successful in whatever that definition of success is. And they're kind of struggling to do that. And they're just awkward at it at first. And like, it's easy to focus on the awkwardness and the the stumbling around as people have that mm -hmm. and they start shitting on each other. Like, it's easy to kind of focus in on that. But I think that's just like people, you know, white belts. There's more white belts in the world than there are black belts, but you yeah. gotta give them a chance to kind of grow. I think on social media, if you put your stuff out there, whatever your stuff is, your content, your views or whatever, you let the chips fall where they may, like that's a different thing than being like, I'm going to, I'm going to tweak what I normally might say and put it up this way because I want these people to like it. Right. And in terms, I also think I have a different viewpoint than you do on people wanting to be successful. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think that many people want to be successful. I think people want to have the appearance of wanting to be successful, but to be successful takes a shitload of work. And most people don't want to put that work in. So they craft this persona of a person who's trying really hard, but just can't catch the break or, uh, you know, these motherfuckers with getting back on my grind. You've never been on a grind. 
You've been on the couch. I so disagree with you. I get, I get it. I get it. You, you. That's your foil. You enjoy that guy on the couch with the Cheetos. Yeah. That's you. That's <laughs> that's your motivation. But just own it. Be like, don't be like back on the ground. Be like, back on the couch. Yeah. Well, you you you're like David Goggins, who's like talking shit to the one guy with the eating Cheetos, and in in so doing, inspires millions to like to actually pursue their success. I get it, but I just think that most people really do want to be successful and are like are trying to work hard and they keep failing. Uh, so I mean, but why I, is it why is it continue? I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but like let's take a person who's overweight. Yeah. Do you not think that person wants to be skinny? Of course they want to be skinny. They just don't want it enough to put the pizza or the pie down and go to the gym. They want it, but they want it to be easy. Of course they want to be skinny. Well, of everyone they, wants it to be easy. Right, and of course but, people people want to be successful, yeah. but do they want it enough to do the work? I don't think they do. I think the easy thing to do is to to create a, a, a an outward-facing persona of the person who really wants it and you get the same reward from a lot of people as the person who actually is successful yeah. very few people differentiate from the person who's found success and the, and the person who's showing you how they're trying to get success on social media yeah. people see that as the same i see i see you're going after the marketing dollar that represents the uh the people that want to work hard yeah <laughs> i like it uh you uh started a podcast recently. Hell yeah. Called, called which people probably from this conversation can oh, I guess we didn't really talk about politics much or the fact that you're a business owner or the fact I came to the conclusion that with the the lockdown and potential future lockdowns, you know, uh in order to pay my mortgage and you know, my bar tab and my Grubhub's out of control. That I would need to find ancillary ways to it's DoorDash slash Lex. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to use Grubhub. <laughs> Grubhub sucks. DoorDash. They, they actually do. Something. DoorDash. No, I'm just kidding. Go just ahead. walk to your local uh, foodery. Seven Eleven. Yeah, and get and get the food. Don't. You don't. can order Seven Eleven from DoorDash or from Post. Co code Lex. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um. But anyway, I thought it was like, oh, I, I should probably increase a little bit my online uh, presence and what would be a way to do that that would be fun for me and entertaining. And I thought, well, uh, a lot of people, yourself included, that I know have done some podcasts and I find uh, that inspiring. And I'm fortunate enough to know. inside jokes and things yeah. like that and it's like it's not that interesting no one wants to like watch you know go to a bar and watch two people at, at the sitting there getting drunk and talking to each other is different than listening to uh like strong discourse yes one interesting thing as a fan of joe rogan i'm a fan i've been a fan of joe rogan for a long time and he has his friends over a lot right and there, there's a aspect to those three, four, five hour conversations that I really enjoy. There's a magic to those. I think he taught the world that those kinds of long form conversations can work. The what you forget is Joe Rogan is a comedian. His friends are also celebrities. Like they know what it's like to be on the mic. They know there is a challenge to actually having your friends on a microphone. Totally. And, like they're, they've never, this is the first time they've been on a microphone. Yeah. And that's actually what you've been doing, which is a very interesting experiment. And uh, you find that some are more awkward than others. Like they're trying to find like, what do I do with this kind of thing? Why, why do you not talk to strangers? Why did you go with people that you're actually know? So the well? simple answer is the people that I selected are both interesting and I thought would be good at talking. But yeah. then I noticed the thing you just mentioned. Like my buddy Paul did the first one, and Paul's a wild man. Yeah. And if you went out with Paul, he can talk about a bazillion topics to a certain to 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 a significant uh, level of depth, right? And he's got a good understanding, and he's got a unique perspective on a lot of things. Um, and I, I think he was the first guy I invited on my podcast, and it was almost like. 
he was on un- a little bit less than natural about yeah. it. And then by the time he loosened up with some drinks, he was it just we were all shit faced. There's it, a there's a phase shift though. It, it, totally. It, yeah. Totally. For yourself as a podcast, like if you if you were to think like you're gonna do, say, I mean, who knows, but say you do a thousand more episodes, right? Like imagine a world where if that that your life continues in that direction that this is like a little parallel to like for me this thing is like a little side hobby but it's also one that's deeply fulfilling um so not just from a business perspective which is not the way i think about it i just think from a life human perspective it's uh, i probably wouldn't have this kind of conversation with you off mic like Mm. this long this deep this attentive there's something really fulfilling about these conversations. So what advice would you have for me? What advice do you have for yourself? Or have you not introspected this uh, that deeply? Oh, I, I have a lot. I have advice. I think the first advice I would give to you is I think you should uh, have me on more often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. first. First And, and second is go often. on your podcast and uh, have a well, conversation. I would... This is the Lex Free Podcast.